add a very warm welcome to this session of Raisina Dialogue 2021. The central theme of this session is Trojan Maneuvers, Capture and Fall of Global Institutions. Now we all know like, that the world as we knew it changed drastically during this one year of the pandemic. The pandemic struck at the very roots of the global order, which was already falling, like many believe. It challenged all our assumptions, be it political or economic, and the pre-pandemic global trends seem redundant. Some of the world shaping forces reached an expiry date. Now, this withering of the pre-pandemic world order is epitomized by the failure of the World Health Organization to play a global leadership and managerial role during the pandemic. It could not or did not provide the leadership expected from it. Other than the World Health Organization, the UN and other institutions like the WTO are also struggling for contemporary relevance. The big question here is, are global bodies independent <clears throat> to function, to serve humanity as they are expected to, or have they been captured to serve national agendas? Another question that we will be looking at is, will existing institutions be replaced by a coalition of the willing? Now, to discuss this, I'm joined by a very exclusive panel, and I would like to welcome all my speakers to this session, I would like to welcome Anthony Abbott, former Prime Minister of Australia, Ms. Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Vikas Swaroop, Secretary West, Minister of External Affairs, India, Kelly W. Chen, Vice President, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, Dr. Asley Tohe, Deputy Head of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. A very warm welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's, it's good afternoon here and it's good evening in New Zealand. So different uh, time, you know, zones and that's the beauty of this virtual world that we are all together. I would like to begin um, with Mr. Anthony Abbott. You know, the pandemic saw a chaotic global response to the virus and most nations turned inward with travel ban, with export control, hoarding or obscuring of uh, information and biggest of all, the marginalization of the World Health Organization and other multilateral organizations. Now, a century back when the pandemic influenza struck, there were very few multilateral organizations and platforms, and which is why most of the countries were fighting this common microbial virus individually. But today there is an array of multilateral platform, and yet we see that most of the nations are taking a very unilateral approach. And now that there is no doubt about the uh, source of the outbreak, but the failure of the WHO to act decisively and swiftly to track the source and contain the pandemic is a big concern. Mr. Abbott, when you look back at this one year, what do you feel? Do the outbreak and the, the feeble attempt to contain its source or to investigate the source rather, the feeble attempt to investigate the source, demonstrate the capture of the institution meant to serve humanity. What are your views? Well, I think self-evidently what you've said is correct. And I think it illustrates a further point, namely that uh, global institutions uh, don't work when the pressure is really on. When the pressure is really on, it tends to be every country for itself or it tends to be um, uh, coalitions of the like-minded uh, doing what they think is best. And what I'd really like to talk about today, if I may, is uh, perhaps the most significant emerging coalition of the like-minded, namely the Quad, uh, which is informally bringing together uh, India, the United States, Japan and Australia. Uh, what the pandemic has made uh, crystal clear, uh, more so than before, is uh, the emergence of a new global competition, uh, every bit as significant 
as the long-running competition between the United States and the old Soviet Union and the camps that they respectively led. Uh, only if I may say so, this is going to be a more difficult uh, competition for the democratic camp, uh, given that China is a first-rate economy, unlike the old Soviet Union, and is rapidly becoming a first-rate military to match. So this quad, uh, bringing together the key democracies of the Indo-Pacific region, is absolutely critically important. And yet, as yet, uh, it is underdeveloped. And I think the key challenge is to make it much more developed uh, in the months and years to come. Apart from participation in the Malabar naval exercises, apart from irregular mid-level official meetings and an abundance of goodwill, there is no well-developed infrastructure behind the Quad, and I think it's vital that this be developed as quickly as possible, perhaps with annual um, two plus two uh, meetings of the respective defence and foreign ministers, perhaps with an annual leaders meeting on the margins uh, of the G20. I think it's also important that there is an economic uh, angle to the Quad. Uh, as we know, the United States uh, uh, tragically dropped out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think the quicker the United States can be brought back into that, uh, the better. If it were possible to interest India in the TPP and make it an Indo-Pacific partnership, I think that would be better still. I also think that as well as deepening the Quad, we need to think of, over time, extending it. Uh, there's talk from President Biden and from Prime Minister Johnson of uh, expanding the G7 into a D10. I think that's a, a very prospective development. If perhaps Korea, Singapore, and possibly even the United Kingdom uh, could come into the quad at some stage, uh, that would be very worthwhile. Now, I've got to say that the answer to nearly every question about China uh, does centre on India, the world's emerging democratic superpower. But given the history, uh, I think we have to be very conscious of the fact, at least Australia and the United States have to be very conscious of the fact, uh, that we are not asking India to join us. We are asking uh, that uh, we can join India. Um, India is going to have to be very much at the heart of the Quad uh, if the Quad is to work. Um, nevertheless, uh, I'm full of optimism. Uh, one of the best uh, relationships I had as Prime Minister was with the remarkable Narendra Modi, who has been a transformative Prime Minister for India and has, I think, made India a significant player on the world stage as opposed simply to the South uh, Asian stage. And uh, uh, this is obviously uh, to the greater global good. So. That's probably enough from me. Uh, there's a yes. lot of work for us to do uh, because the challenges are just getting bigger all the time. Absolutely. The challenges are getting bigger and we will come back to you with mm. more questions. But mm -hmm. yes, let me open the panel to uh, for the initial views from all our speakers. Uh, and uh, I would like to go across to former Prime Minister Ms. Helen Clark. What are your views on it? And I would like to actually get an idea of what you feel about the about the capture and the fall of the global institutions. Um, uh, Mr. Abbott spoke about the Quad and the expanding of the Quad and the coming together actually of the like-minded countries and expanding the G7. Uh, or when we look at uh, you know not just the coalition of the like-minded, but the, but the organizations, the existing organizations, and how they fared during this pandemic. Uh, what are your views? Do you think that uh, the way they functioned, or rather not functioned, actually pointed out to the capture of the institutions which were meant to serve humanity? Well, firstly, I think that the global institutions are only as strong as the support they get from the whole uh, range of, of member states. Look, I come from a small country, you know, a five million population country, so clearly the global institutions where we all have a voice, 
uh, are extremely important to, to us. New Zealand's never going to get a seat at the G20 table. Uh, it's not going to get a, a, a That's seat. That's not at true, table. Helen. I gave but you a seat at the G20. You, you did. You gave. You did give John Key a seat, and you were very kind to invite us. You're the only country hosting G20 that did invite New Zealand to come and, and be part of it. So it was it was exceptional. Uh, but uh, basically, we, we do rely on the global uh, institutions. I must say, I think that APEC could have stepped up more on the on the pandemic, as the East Asia Pacific, uh, West Coast, North and, and South America regional organisation. Uh, I recall when I was a Prime Minister at APEC many years ago, leading the discussion on HIV. And HIV was discussed at APEC because obviously, uh, if you have a raging epidemic of HIV, that impacts on productivity, health of populations, economic performance, and so on. And I think absolutely uh, this should be a, a topic that really uh, galvanises uh, APEC leaders. But, but let's come back to uh, the issue you raised about the WHO, because for, for my sins, I have been co-chairing this uh, review panel of the internationally coordinated uh, response uh, to uh, the COVID-19 uh, pan pandemic. And uh, my first comment would be, you know, WHO would only be as strong as the support it gets from member states on this as on uh, everything else. So I don't say that WHO has failed. But I do say, immediately qualifying that, that member states have not given it the authority it needs to act decisively, having given it the independence it needs to act decisively. And frankly, once WHO gives important advice, like it declares a public health emergency of international concern, as it did on the 30th of January, member states need to jump, and to few did. Uh, so you know, WHO has no right of access to a country to investigate an outbreak. It can only ask, and ask, and ask again. Uh, it is quite restricted in what it can publish about what it knows about a country in an outbreak without a country's agreement. It is restricted by the 2005 International Health Regulations, which limit its ability to take a precautionary approach. Our panel is on the record as saying that at the very first sign of human-to-human -human transmission, uh, WHO should have been able to uh, to act in a precautionary way. But the international health regulations don't really uh, permit that. They want more evidence. <laughs> you can't wait for evidence. Pandemics are on a plane. This isn't a medieval play where it travelled by foot. We're so interconnected these, these days. Then you can look at uh, other ways in which the international health regulations agreed by member states constrain WHO. For example, the Director General is obliged to seek the advice of an emergency committee on whether or not to declare a public health emergency of international concern. Well, when he convened it in the third week of January, it didn't agree to issue a declaration. Clearly, it should have. It took another week for that to happen. And then, as I say, when the emergency was declared, so many countries took a wait and see attitude uh, rather than absolutely going on the front foot to um, combat that. And the rest is history. So what I would say is, no, it didn't fail, but member states have failed it by not giving it the power it needs and not acting uh, comprehensively uh, and collaboratively as they need to once uh, an emergency is declared. All right. Uh, so, Ms. Helen Clark mentioned about how the WHO can only be as strong as the member state, and it did not really fail, but it did fall short of the expectation. And um, I would like to bring in Katy W. Chen here and uh, know your views on what do you feel of the functioning of the multilateral organizations during the time of the of the pandemic. Thank you very much. Um, I very much agree with former Prime Minister Clark um, with her opinion of the WHO is um, as strong as uh, the member states. Um, Taiwan is actually not a member of the WHO, and um, it has been prevented from participating as an observer since 2016. Um, however, uh, under um, past year, 
Uh, I would say that the Taiwanese administration has been really handling um, COVID-19, uh, combating um, the pandemic uh, relatively well. Um, just to update um, our esteemed panelists and our audience, um, as of today, um, Taiwan has about 1,067 um, confirmed cases of COVID, and um, the death um, number um, in Taiwan is 11. Um, so uh, the Taiwanese uh, government had um, emailed the, the, the uh, WHO um, at the very last date of 2019, um, informing that there's some kind of lung, lung disease um, from China and that one of the patients had been quarantined, so there's the possibility of human-to-human -human transmission. Um, however, um, we did not receive um, any confirmation. So the administration in Taiwan um, start to test um, individuals coming from uh, Wuhan, and they essentially um, control the borders and ration um, the masks. So um, without the uh, assistance from um, the WHO, I think the Taiwanese administration had to fend for itself. Um, however, um, if we observe what, what's been happening in the past year, um, I would say that um, Taiwan is more than willing um, and more than capable to assist uh, when it comes to um, the pandemic. If um, there is um, a, a, another uh, wave. So as of last summer, uh, Taiwan actually had been donating about 51 million uh, facial masks to countries around the world, to North America, to Europe. Um, and um, I think this this is one of the uh, many reasons that uh, a non-member uh, state like Taiwan uh, will be uh, a, a really uh, welcome addition um, to a international organization such as the WHO. And um, I, I really do believe that international organizations is really important for countries uh, to come together in times of crisis. So um, I would say that um, international organizations, in my personal opinion, should not uh, be a conduit to um, a, a regime's uh, a political um, aspiration to advance global influence. And I think that um, right now is a uh, important and critical times for democracies to come together uh, to try to work together in order uh, to combat a uh, global pandemic as such and uh, to deal with future crisis if it had emerged. Thank you. A uh, very interesting point made there. The national organization should not be a conduit for countries' political ambitions grow, uh, to attain their global power. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of uh, critique of uh, international organizations and them failing to rise to the occasion during the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Astley Tohe, what are your views? Do you think these critiques are fair of organizations like the WHO? Do you think the multipolarities are making multilateralism more difficult? Well, I think that it's important to take uh, take into consideration that this is a trend that has been ongoing for, for quite a while, at least going back to 2008. We see that the institutions that were uh, that were built after uh, World War II are all struggling um, to various degrees. We see this in NATO, we see it in the EU, we see it in the World Health Organization, we see it in the, uh, in the UN. And this has everything to do with polarity and the changes in power dynamics in the world. Uh, the world now finds itself in a sort of incomplete multipolarity that actually resembles more of a new bipolar system with China and the United States being the moving powers. At the same time, we know that China, that, that India will join this uh, most, uh, most esteemed and powerful group of, of states. And I would like to say that uh, I would have loved to have been with you in Delhi. It's, it's, it's truly a magnificent sight to see the development of India over the past 30 years. I have been so lucky that I have visited India regularly all the way going back to 1992. And the changes have been spectacular. And I would like to commend India on showing 
the world how to produce sufficient amounts of vaccines in a short period of time. We all thank you for that. Uh, all that said, I think that the critique of the World Health Organization is to some extent unfair. Uh, the World Health Organization and the travails that it has encountered during the fighting of the COVID uh, pandemic has very much been uh, been the result of uh, or well close to what we have seen uh, in uh, uh, the relationship between the United States and, and China. They don't play very well together and, uh, and the World Health Organization has been struggling to chart uh, a path between the power interests of various countries and at the same time we all know that the tale of the Covid crisis has had a great many twists and turns. When that is said, I think if we go back to a um, book that was written by E.H. Carr uh, in uh, 1939 called The Twenty Years Crisis where he examines what happened in the breakdown of the international system, he points to three fa factors uh, that, is, that needs to be present for a world order to, um, to collapse or to turn, in, turn on itself. And one is that uh, you need to have powerful and resentful actors on the ma margins of the international order. Uh, second, you need to have a long and profound economic crisis. Uh, and third, uh, the system determining power, in our case the United States, grows uninterested in policing the international system and maintaining the rules. Unfortunately, what we have seen uh, during the Trump presidency and to some extent also during the Obama presidency is that the, the Americans are taking a step back. So what we are seeing is an international system where uh, the, the power dynamics amongst the key actors makes it difficult for international uh, organizations to operate as they are, were intended. That being said, I think that we need to look to organizations that have succeed, uh, that have been successful, like the World Food Program that was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize last year, that stepped up and did amazing work, saving hundreds of thousands, probably millions of lives through a, a good uh, and, and timely response. And I do think that this, uh, the, uh, the, the solution for international organizations, be it the World Health Organization or the UN, is to be more focused on delivering actual results for, uh, for the population of the globe. And I think that if international organization, to a lesser extent, is able to get out of this um, bipolar game that is being played between Western powers and China in, uh, on every venue about wordings and uh, about how the organizations are to operate, uh, I think this must be the solution. But right now, uh, unfortunately, the power dynamics in the world make it difficult for international organizations to operate as they should. And I must rem uh, uh, underline that in t today's world, there are very few big challenges that are purely, purely national. And I think most states will agree to that. And maybe small countries such as Norway and New Zealand, both countries of about 5 million people, that very hard quite to be good citizens in the world. Uh, maybe countries such as Norway and New Zealand can chart some of the path, being non-powerful actors, but very interested in maintaining the multilateral aspects of the international system. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, when you make the point that it, the power, the current power dynamics, the global power dynamics actually make it difficult for multilateral organizations to function as they should, uh, I would like to pose this question to Secretary West, the Castro of Ministry of External Affairs, that when we talk of how it's difficult for multilateral organizations to function, what kind of reforms are we looking at? Uh, which will which which will be helpful here? Can global institutions really be rescued from great power ambitions? Because Katie W. Chen had earlier pointed out that these global institutions should not become a conduit uh, to the power ambitions of certain in countries on the global platform. So, how can they be rescued, or can they be rescued from power ambitions? What kind of reforms and restructuring? Thank you, Nagba. <clears throat> I think uh, the question you have posed is truly one of the central questions of our time. We are in the midst of a global pandemic, as we all know, and yet we found that most UN institutions failed to rise to the occasion and put forth a timely, global, coordinated, well-prepared and effective response. And that is why I think reformed multilateralism is the need of the hour, and this can only be made possible by making multilateral institutions more inclusive, more representative, more democratic, and most importantly, more legitimate. 
Take the case of the UN Security Council, for instance. How can you have a situation where the main international body tasked with upholding international law still be stuck in the time warp of 1945, where, you know, after the Second World War, to the victor belonged the spoils? How can you have a situation where Africa, on which the UN Security Council spends approximately 80% of its time, still does not have a permanent seat at the high table? And that is why uh, India has been in the forefront of the call for reformed multilateralism, for reforming and expanding the United Nations Security Council and making it, uh, you know, fit for purpose. Not just the United Nations Security Council. I think uh, all uh, international institutions need to be made uh, fit for purpose. And this is only possible by ensuring the full participation of developing countries as genuine stakeholders in global governance and decision making. This is the only thing that can ensure that global institutions are not held captive to great power rivalries and ambitions. And I think it is in the interest of the great powers themselves to have a body whose decisions are seen as legitimate and democratic. Now, there are many who will say that, uh, you know, this is easier said than done, that the entrenched powers would never allow the cozy club that they are running uh, from being reformed, from being changed. All I would say is, let's remember 1965. Now, that is the only time when the United, Secu United Nations Security Council was actually expanded and the number of non-permanent members went up from 6 to 10. At that time also, almost everybody said this was impossible, but it was done. And don't forget, at that time, the membership of the United Nations was less than 50. Today, there are 193 members of the United Nations, and yet we just have a 15-member Security Council, and we just have the five permanent members who have been there since 19, uh, 1945. Of course, one member changed, uh, as you know, uh, uh, took, on, took on a seat uh, a bit later. And I think now, when we are in the 75th anniversary year of the United Nations, this is an idea whose time has come. This is an idea which cannot be stopped any longer. And that is why India is once again in the forefront, together with the uh, you know, with the G4, which includes Germany, uh, Japan, and Brazil, we are spearheading uh, reform of the United Nations Security Council, changing the methods by which we are even debating this issue in the intergovernmental negotiations process to be at least conforming to UN processes, where there is, for every negotiation, there is a written text. But in the intergovernmental negotiations, we don't even have a written text. We are negotiating in thin air. And we are working not only with the G4 group, we are also working with Africa, we are working with a very large group of like-minded countries called the L69. And we are very confident that eventually through the combined weight of the vast majority of the United Nations, we will be able to effect change. I have always believed in what Nelson Mandela once said. It always seems impossible till it is done. Great. And you said that uh, this is an idea whose time has come and you emphasized on the need of reformed multilateralism. Uh, uh, Mr. Rabat, would you like to come in on that? I mean, when we talk of reform multilateralism and we also talk about uh, how intensification of multilateralism is really the need of the hour, but how can it be made more inclusive and less susceptible to capture? Because when we say that these global institutions are actually, uh, you know, held captive to global power, so what kind of reforms can we look at so that they are less susceptible to this capture? Uh, look, I'm sceptical, I have to say, uh, about global institutions where major countries' perceived self-interest is directly at, uh, at, at, at issue. And um, yes, we all know that the WHO uh, badly mishandled uh, its initial response to the pandemic, and we all know that the WHO has done a completely bodgy investigation into what happened in Wuhan. Uh, simply because China wouldn't let it. It just wouldn't let it. And it didn't matter what the rules said, uh, China wasn't going to play by them. Simple as that. So, so look, I think it's important to make use of global institutions where we can without expecting too much of them. Now, I certainly think that the UN would be improved if India was part of the Security Council. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure... What else I'd do? Uh, uh, but certainly it would be a more effective Security Council if India was there. Um, 
particularly given the fact that India now wants to be uh, much more uh, uh, pro properly assertive on the global stage. Um, possibly Japan should come in as well uh, as another very important economic power and a not insignificant military power. Um, but but uh, anybody that gets too big becomes completely unwieldy. Uh, so, uh, so I wouldn't expand the Security Council beyond putting in India and possibly Japan. Over to you, Nagma. All right, but I would like to take this question to Ms. Helen Clark. And when we, when uh, Mr. Abbott talks about not too much dependence on the organizations, what do you think of that point? Uh, do you think there is uh, too much focus on institutions? Uh, and uh, if I take the question further, what ways or what reforms can we look at to make these global institutions more inclusive like um, uh, Secretary Vice Vikasuru pointed out that developing countries should be made equal stakeholders there. How can these be more inclusive and can countries address the inefficiency of, the, of global organizations through reforms that tackle vested interest and institutional inertia? Well firstly institutions are important. Uh, we know that in our national government experience that we need strong institutions to underpin the functioning of the state. So if we want global cooperation across the wide range of challenges that our world faces, we, we need strong institutions that can support that uh, cooperation. And that's why it's always uh, distressing to me uh, when the international system comes under uh, pressure because we need it. We need the IMF, we need the World Bank, we need the UN, we need the Security Council uh, to function, we, we need the WHO at its very best, we need the Human Rights Commission, we, we need, need, need. Uh, so the issue is uh, how to reform them and support them so they can play the role that their founders in, envisage. Now clearly it, it's easier to reform some institutions than others, the last really serious go at putting the Security Council composition uh, issue on the agenda was with Kofi Annan and uh, I think the uh, Indian uh, uh, Secretary will uh, agree with me that at, at that time there was quite a dialogue and the group of four that he referred to, India, uh, Japan, uh, Germany and Brazil were very active and are still a voice uh, today. And each of them has a strong case, right? If we're looking at who are the geopolitical movers and shakers today, you have a very powerful group of, of four there. Of course, to get the form, you need not only two thirds of the UN General Assembly, you need all the permanent members agreeing. And that's been uh, the rub uh, to, uh, to get that agreement. The sad thing is that the longer reform is delayed, uh, the longer the Security Council will, in a sense, with us because it's not seen as representative of today's uh, geopolitics. I think as urgent is for the great powers themselves to reflect on the gridlock in which the uh, Security Council uh, now operates. Uh, thinking back to the comment that was made about how in the 1960s it was possible, even then in the middle of the Cold War, uh, to expand the Security Council uh, non-permanent membership. Look, there were very great issues between the Soviet Union and the United States of America, but they were able from time to time to put those very serious differences aside and to seek agreement where it was in the interests of humanity. Last year, the anniversary was passed as of the 40th year since the eradication of smallpox. That was achieved by international cooperation at the height of the Cold War. So what I think the challenge now is to our great and emerging powers is to acknowledge that we have differences, and there are very profound differences between countries. But we have to focus on what we have in common and our shared interest in functioning institutions and try to find ways forward. And I must say with respect to the WHO and the international system arising out of this pandemic, uh, our, our review panel will be making uh, recommendations which we will be seeking uh, support for as a package. Because we know if the world can't come together around a more effective uh, set of international mechanisms 
uh, and measures that institutions can take. We are doomed to repeat the history of this pandemic, just as this one has repeated the history of 1918, which also touched all corners uh, of the world. Uh, so that would be, be my view. I think the institutions have to be more inclusive. The IMF also has very challenging times with its quota uh, review process and trying to make that uh, reflect uh, today's uh, reality as, as, as well. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Aslitohe, your comments on that. How can institutions be more, it can be made more inclusive, as Ms. Helen Clark pointed out, that the great challenge in front of the emerging and the great powers is that they have to put aside the differences and come together. But that did not happen during this hour of need, during this pandemic. How can they be more made more inclusive? And how can all the stakeholders there have a voice? Any any kind of we all talk of reforms. Reforms are in uh, the idea whose time has come. But what concrete steps? I don't think that it's likely that we will see any reform of the UN Security Council. Uh, we have tried on numerous occasions. And despite everybody agreeing that at least India should be included in the Security Council, perhaps Japan, Brazil, even Germany, uh, I don't think that is likely. Uh, Norway is currently holding a seat at the UN Security Council, and our agenda there has been to strike a blow for effective multilateralism. And I do think that international organizations still have an important role to play. Under the, under the premise of multilateral cooperation. Of course, that is more time consuming than great power caveat. At a time when the great powers seem unable to provide the leadership uh, that other states have the right to expect from them in the Security Council, I think that we will have to find workarounds. And I think any, any, any workaround will have to involve uh, the established institution. I don't see any way around that. I don't think that this incessant uh, institution building that we have been seeing for the past 10 years, but that has frankly led to a degree of open leading to process shopping in the international uh, system where different powers prefer to deal with different issues in different, different organizations uh, where they feel that they will get the best hearing. Uh, but this whole thing makes international politics very, very unpredictable in a sense. So I think that we need to rally around the, the United Nations and we need to re-establish the United Nations as, uh, a, a, as, as the home of multilateralism. And I realize that multilateralism is a method. It's not a goal unto itself. But I do think that in this situation, that we now find ourselves with a great many challenges that need to be addressed, and at the same time, uh, the relation between the great powers being in such a state that it's unlikely to see any big initiatives. I think we have to go small. I do think that multilateralism and building coalition within the frameworks of the established institutions is the way to go. It's not ideal, but I do think that unbalance is the best uh, path forward. Mm. Like you said, multilateralism is not the goal, it's just the mean. And this pandemic has uh, shown us the need for better cooperation. Uh, it, it showed us that it is no one is safe until everyone is safe and that we have to fight this out together. Keti Chen, your views on reforms and for making organizations more inclusive and uh, so that they can rise to the challenge if there is a similar pandemic in the future, are we better prepared and how can we be, be better prepared to deal with it as, as, uh, as a world? Um, I think most importantly that uh, members of the international organizations and countries around the world just cannot be uh, complacent. I think right now all the speakers and um, leaders around the world have been made aware under the current pandemic situation that um, coasting is not good enough um, anymore. So. Um, and I very much agree with um, Secretary Vickers, um, his uh, opinion on updating the existing uh, international organization to reflect the needs of the modern um, age. And um, I guess for me, 
uh, making uh, international organizations more inclusive means, um, for example, including um, Taiwan, a, a, a country that has been doing uh, very well under the pandemic situation, um, you know, um, allowing uh, the administration, the experts from, from Taiwan to assist when countries uh, within the international organizations need the help, uh, need shared information, hold side events um, at these international meetings. I think that's how we could make it um, more uh, inclusive. And perhaps member uh, states and member nations needs to come together and trying to uh, figure out a way to deal with uh, another member state who is refused to adhere to the uh, international uh, role-based order. Um, uh, so how does uh, the group of nations going to deal with that uh, very effectively? So um, that, that's my opinion on, on the reforms. Thank you. Well, all, all right. And now talking of the pandemic, we the world has reached that stage of of vaccination, and we've also heard terms like vaccine nationalism. Uh, you know, whereas the UN Secretary General spoke of vaccine equity, and that is the, that should be the moral responsibility of the nations. But is it? Do you think is it time? to question the private sector for raising barriers to a really easy and equitable distribution and access to vaccine through IPR and related trade issues. Uh, would you like to take that question, Mr. Rabbit? Yeah, look, uh, thanks, Nagma. Huh. The problem is not so much vaccine nationalism, the problem is vaccine production, because if there was enough to go around, uh, no one would be feeling the need to hoard it. Uh, but uh, because there's not enough to go around, obviously everyone's saying, well, my people come first. Now, mm. what we are seeing is, is a degree of uh, vaccine favouritism. Uh, as always, uh, China is using this to advance its geopolitical interests. Um, and, and I think it's important that uh, a country like Australia, for instance, which does have uh, the capacity to ramp up uh, very rapidly pr production of the AstraZeneca jab um, does swiftly make as much as possible of it available in our region, uh, particularly to the Pacific, uh, to try to ensure that those countries don't fall further into the orbit of, uh, of, our, of, our, of our great northern friend. Um, so, look, uh, uh, yes, uh, we have to do the right thing, uh, but doing the right thing starts with ramping up production mm -hmm. so that we can vaccinate our own people as quickly as possible and then make it available to everyone else. Sure. Uh, uh, Vikas Swaroop, I would like your views on that. Uh, India is a country which ha who has been engaging in vaccine matri and we've been exporting as well. Uh, you know, India has been doing its bit. Your comments on, on this? Uh, you had framed the question on whether it is that it is time to question the private sector for raising yes. barriers to easy and equitable access to vaccines. And I think it would be totally wrong to put the blame entirely on the private sector. After all, it was the Indian private sector, for instance, which delivered when it came to global supply of vaccines. And under the Vaccine Maitri Initiative, we have supplied 65 million doses to more than 85 countries all across the world. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, when the pandemic first started, we did not produce any PPE kits at all. We did not produce any ventilators. There were just some companies making face masks. But thanks to the private sector, we were able to ramp up uh, production. And today, India is the second largest producer of PPE kits and face masks in the world. Uh, same goes for ventilators. So it was, again, it was the private sector which was able uh, to uh, rise to the occasion. And the same goes for the you know pharm pharmaceutical companies all across the world. Uh, having said that, I think the best model is that of a public-private partnership. Uh, and one example, again, from India is that of the Indian uh, indigenous vaccine called Covaxin, which is a joint production between a private company called Bharat Biotech and the Indian Council of Medical Research, which is a, which is a government entity. I think it is only through a harmonious uh, interface between government and the private sector, where government provides a supportive environment, uh, for the private sector to take the necessary risks uh, to speed up vaccine development, which, as you know, otherwise takes decades uh, to, uh, to, uh, to achieve. 
uh, and that is why i think uh, you know we need to look more closely at this model the issue of ipr patents etc are in any case guided by national and international regulatory regimes therefore putting the blame entirely on the private sector may not be the best way to move forward in the middle of the pandemic right now we need the collaboration of the private sector to as prime minister abbott said ramp up production so that every country can get it and there is no need for vaccine nationalism so so okay so that there is no need for vaccine nationalism and the countries can come together now uh, we are almost reaching the end of this session but before we end i would like all of you to make a final comment when we look at the how we began this discussion and the central theme is captured in fall of global institutions or are the trojan maneuvers captured in fall of global institutions and we spoke of the of how global institutions were uh, falling short of expectation during this time and were not not strong enough and the lessons that we learned during this pandemic i would like all of you to for your closing comments your final word a short comment uh, i'd like to begin with you miss helen clark uh, first thing i'd like to put on the table uh, that it's timely to be activating article 109 of the un charter maybe india could consider this uh, because our article 109 provides for a general conference of the members of the un to be convened for the purpose of reviewing the charter and to get that review you don't get uh, the permanent members being able to veto it you need 2/3 of the general assembly members uh, to vote for this and and 2/3 of the security council no no veto by permanent members so i think holding a general review conference at this time to look at the charter would actually be a good initiative and the charter Uh, provides for that. My other concluding comment would be uh, with respect to this last question you asked about the uh, the vaccines. And Tony Abbott is right. We need radically scaled up production. So the question is, what's going to make that possible? Look, I am aware of the South African and Indian initiative to have the uh, TRIPS agreement uh, waived uh, for the duration of the pandemic to give access to technologies and and, and medicines which, which will help. I support this. It would need to be complemented by, as the Indian Secretary has said, uh, the companies then sharing the IP and the technology. You know, this really quite very innovative a vaccine which Pfizer and Moderna had. It's not a simple thing to produce. There's a lot of knowledge and technology transfer required. What I would appeal to our private sector companies, which have this IP. is go back and research the history of Jonas Salk uh, the scientist who invented the vaccine against polio and when he was asked did he want to make money from it he said no i don't want a cent this is for humanity surely these vaccines are for humanity that's the spirit that we have to go forward with so we can ramp up production and when the up production is a matter of equity in every citizen in the world being able to access it but it's also in our common interest because if we can't stop rampant transmission we will all be like a dog chasing its tail with more challenging bearing after more challenging bearing and we will find it very hard to stop this so that's my plea all right over to you dr asle tohe I would very much like to support uh, Prime Minister Clark in uh, in her suggestion for 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 a law article 109. I uh, I I think it's time. We are probably now heading into quite a turbulent phase of of the history of mankind. This is not just only because of the power rivalry between the United States and China. Uh, we see a great many challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, on top of that list, we find two issues: the climate and uh, nuclear disarmament. Uh, unfortunately, as things are, and the experiences that we have uh, that we have made uh, in multilateral forums lately, I'm not sure that we will be able to make the headway in terms of reforms, and that we might we will have to address the crisis with what we got. and i think to the, the to, to that end i think it is very very important that we don't undermine, uh, undermine the the un uh, at this stage i think with the uh, with the general secretary here is now being uh, taking re-election at the helm of the un and with the general secretary having good relations with all the great powers 
there is a chance that the, that the UN will deliver well. Uh, but I think the one single issue where we will see the potential for, for, uh, for, for the UN is in terms of nuclear disarmament. And I think this is the main issue that we will be tackling going forward. Uh, whilst we have been busy with the pandemic, we see a very unsettling shift towards uh, rearmament and redevelopment of nuclear weapons among the great powers. And I, I would like to remind the panel that whilst there are many challenges facing mankind, there is no single threat that could end our collective development of the species as abruptly as a nuclear war. And this has been one of the things has been following us from the very beginning, from the, from the beginning of the UN. And I think that uh, the dismantling of the, uh, of the arms control regime has been one of the great omissions, one of the great failings of international politics in the past, in the past decades. And I think once uh, the pandemic uh, abates, I think this will be the big issue that we will have to address. And I would very much like to see in the context uh, of uh, Article 109, this issue being at the very core of the process because it is one of the shared interests for all men, all nations on Earth. Yeah, all right. Uh, Katie Chen, uh, when you uh, look at the year that's gone by, the failings and the learnings, if you can sum it up as your final comments. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually very happy to hear and be on the panel and uh, know that there is a synchronized agreement that there is a need for reform and countries around the world needs to come together uh, to resolve uh, important issues. And um, I really believe that uh, important issues such as global health, uh, nuclear armament, uh, hunger, um, and environmental issues are, um, are uh, so important that uh, we cannot allow uh, one country or a uh, few countries in the world to play politics uh, using these important issues. And lastly, I would like to leave um, uh, you with is that um, in Taiwan, there's 23 million people standing ready and capable to assist with all these important issues when it comes uh, up. Thank you. Your final comments, Mr. Abbott. Well, thanks very much, Nagma. Look, uh, I think uh, globalism is, is, is all very well, and there is no doubt that we can get global cooperation on some issues. Uh, I think back to my own time of the cooperation between the United States and China, for instance, and indeed many other countries to find MH370, unfortunately, uh, as yet unsuccessful. But on other issues, we, we simply aren't going to get global cooperation. Um, take the question of Taiwan. Uh, I fear at some point in the not too distant future, countries are going to have to choose. Uh, do they help defend Taiwan or do they not? Um, this is an absolutely critical question before the world, given China's obvious determination to take back Taiwan as quickly as it can. And, and I think that on something like that, uh, we just have to make it crystal clear that there are very serious consequences if there is any attempt to alter the status quo by force, um, regardless of what China might say uh, uh, regarding what it thinks is its own internal territory. Uh, we've got 25 million people in Taiwan who've uh, created a wonderful life for themselves, uh, and they should be able to determine their own future. So look, yes, uh, we have to make the most of the global institutions we've got. Uh, we've got to try to improve them wherever we can. But I think we also have to accept uh, that as long as there are fundamental differences of opinion, um, in the end, people will have to take sides and let, uh, let more people <laughs> take the right yeah. one. <laughs> like uh, Ms. Helen Clark had pointed out, that the challenges uh, between uh, in front of the great powers as well as the developing powers who set aside those differences. Mm -hmm. uh, the Secretary uh, West, uh, Vikas Farooq, your final comments uh, when we look at uh, the future of multilateralism, cooperation and the challenges and the role of uh, the, the global institutions. 
Uh, thank you, Nagba. Uh, in closing, I would only say that the need of the hour is for the international community to speak in a united and coherent voice in dealing with this pandemic, which is easily the biggest challenge the world has faced since the Second World War. Uh, when it comes to vaccine equity, uh, you know, uh, India has put its money where its mouth is. We are the ones we have put forward a plan for TRIPS waiver and through our vaccine metri initiative, we are already doing our bit to help humanity, uh, as Prime Minister Modi has said. We fully support the WHO uh, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Helen Clark's uh, role uh, in the independent panel. Uh, we do believe that uh, the WHO will have a central role in, uh, you know, in understanding the origins of this virus. And that is why their researchers must get full and complete access so that the origin can be scientifically determined and is accompanied with timely and comprehensive sharing of data, as this would be the base and a very important learning on how to deal with future viruses and ensure that they do not become pandemics. Finally, the reform of the uh, international institutions is extremely important, whether it is through a you know, review of the charter itself uh, or it is through some other mechanism. Whatever happens, it's important that we make these uh, international bodies fit for purpose, in tune with the current day realities, and they should reflect the vibrancy and diversity that we see in the world today, rather than being, you know, a cozy club of, uh, you know, some powers uh, who owe their uh, power only to what happened in the Second World War. It's very, very important that the United Nations Security Council be expanded, uh, be reformed, with the inclusion of new permanent and non-permanent members, and we will do whatever is within our power to ensure that it actually happens. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you all for participating and being a part of this wonderful panel discussion and putting forth your ideas. And like uh, people, uh, all of you pointed out, uh, the multilateral organizations, the global organizations, clearly did not rise to the occasion, did not really meet uh, the expectations. But it is time for reformed multilateralism. It is time that these global uh, institutions be reformed and they should be reflective of the vibrancy and diversity uh, in the world. And they should not act as a conduit uh, for global ambition of some nations. And that's the need of the hour. It's an idea whose time has uh, come. Global institutions cannot be held captive to global powers. With that, we shall conclude this session of the Ricina Dialogue 2021. Thank you all for being with us.